Well, it's uh, four o'clock um, CT, and I'm um, delighted to welcome you um, to this Alliance Magazine webinar. Greetings from London, and welcome to colleagues from foundations, social movements, NGOs, and others around the globe for today's webinar on social movements and philanthropy. I hope you and your loved ones um, are safe and well wherever you are tuning in from today. I'm Charles Keaton. I have the privilege of editing Alliance and moderating today's discussion. Our purpose in this discussion today is to explore the interplay and tensions between social movements and philanthropy. We'll highlight key issues, trends and controversies, all drawing on our latest print issue, which has been guest edited by Halima Mohammed, Graciela Hopstein and Romy Kramer. Alliance is a leading non-profit publication covering global philanthropy and tries to offer nuanced, in-depth coverage online and through our quarterly print issue. For those of you who are less familiar with our work, I should say that we mark the publication of each issue with a discussion of the special feature, which comprises about half of each edition. Typically, these events are held in London, but I'm delighted that today's event is and will be attended by, I think, up to, uh, up to or over 300 of you around the world. If you find today's discussion engaging, I would encourage you to subscribe using the code movements20 at alliancemagazine.org. You can see the code on your screen and you'll get a 20% discount. It's an important way to support our work as well as yours. While this movement's issue was planned well before the current interest stemming from the Black Lives Matter protests, movements have for some time been playing a central role in civil society, yet they've rarely featured in funders' strategies and theories of change, with only or less than 1% of funding directed by philanthropy to movements, according to Candid's latest data. Is this set to change? We'll be discussing that. Um, we'll be um, responding to questions that you've submitted in advance and hearing from movement um, representatives as part of this discussion, looking at the relationship between philanthropy and movements, why it's sometimes uneasy, who some of the leading figures are, and what can be done to bridge the gap or the divide between movements on the one hand and philanthropy on the other. And maybe we'll have a chance to think about what the recent pandemic might do in terms of a new wave and generation of social movements. Panelists um, will talk just for five minutes. Um, we've disabled the audio, but we do want your input. Um, tell us how you're feeling, where you're coming from, what's on your mind, and you'll see a button on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to address as many of these questions. We particularly welcome reaction from funders of movements as well as movements themselves, and there's an opportunity to send us letters after this webinar, which can be printed, considered for publication and printed in our next issue. And, the mo and this recording will also be um, uh, shared shortly after with all of you. And our hashtag finally today before I hand over to the panelists is social movement philanthropy. So I hope you enjoy the next hour with us. So first of all, just turning to um, Halima Mohammed in South Africa. Halima is an independent philanthropy researcher and leading thinker on this topic. Um, Halima, over to you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, so over the last decade, I've been spending a lot of time trying to understand the role of philanthropy in building a more just society. And throughout the themes of agency, power and voice of those most affected by injustice emerge over and over again. In particular, the limitations of philanthropy in working in ways that truly allow space for these and the need for fundamental shifts in philanthropic orientation, approach and practice. Um, there was clearly huge disjuncture between our stated values and our actual practice. At the same time, Beyond the African continent, we've seen and experienced so many examples of local organizing and civic action that are far beyond the narrow civic spaces that philanthropy is comfortable supporting. Civic action that in some cases has led to massive shifts, and yet, in most cases, philanthropy has stood by unsure if and how to engage. And so I found myself asking, what would it mean and what would it take for philanthropy to begin engaging with such civic spaces, of which movements are probably the most visible example? Um, I focus on the word engage because at the very least, even if you're not supporting movements, your work and the work of those you do support is fundamentally influenced in one way or another by movement action. Not understanding the role of the broader civic space and their goals is a disservice. So beyond engagement, I then begin asking what does support look like? And again, language is important. Support is not necessarily grants. It can take many forms, but the keys that we as philanthropy should not be determining what is appropriate level of engagement to support. 
if we're committed to the values of acting in solidarity, then what we engage in and how <clears throat> needs to be informed by those doing the work, not by our own limited sphere of knowledge from afar. And so as I began exploring these issues, Charles and I began to also have a conversation. Um, and I was looking at this issue um, around movements in Africa particularly, and to no surprise, there was almost no discourse in philanthropy that was actually informed by movement voices. Um, I then began looking broader afield and saw the global philanthropy discourse was also limited. And so after much conversation, you know, and uh, writing a short piece for Alliance back then, which is I think 18 months ago, um, the idea of an Alliance issue was born. And so I really do want to thank Alliance um, for providing the space for us to engage. Um, some of the, Charles has asked me to speak to two things. One is some of the key things I was seeing in the research on, that I did with African movements. And second is some of the key things we're seeing coming out um, of this issue. So we'll start with the African context first. Um, I did a, interviews with a range of movement leaders across the continent and several things stood out. The first was that any conversation on this topic must first recognize the enormous scale of philanthropic contributions by the activist members and their supporters themselves. So when we talk about philanthropy and movements, it's not just institutional philanthropy that plays a role. Um, the local philanthropy is, is plays an enormous contribution and that's rarely ever recognized. Many movements relied on internal movement and local resourcing for their core co activities, and they preferred to continue this. Interestingly, they were not in, opposed to engaging with philanthropy, but it was the how of the engagement that was critical. The experience is that despite good intentions of match institutional philanthropy, they have not been very good at stepping back from agenda setting or trying to influence movement activities. The reality is that money came with power and movements had to decide if they wanted to engage with the implications of that and how. Many, many chose not to. Um, and that's quite an indictment on our sector. Um, the second is that philanthropy was overly concerned about form, about engaging with legally registered institutions as a basis for support and giving its trust. And it's pushing for movements to have structures and systems that made its own grants and accountability processes easier to manage, took precedence over enabling support that allowed these spaces to be as effective as they could. There have been significant neg negative consequences emerging from this. Movements themselves are not objecting to accountability. I have to emphasize that. But to who frames what they're being held accountable for and how. Uh, the third thing that came out of that research was that there was a strong call for funders who want to engage with movements to think, to radically rethink both the substance and the process of their work. Um, all of this needed to be transformed. Um, I know that um, Hussein Muhiwa from Lucha in Congo and Ebrima Sal from Trust Africa, um, who is working with um, a movement fund, uh, are both here on this call. And I'd like to also invite them um, as we continue this discussion to provide their perspectives. I think it's, it's really important that um, it's not just our voices that are dominating. Um, and that has been the spirit of the entire Alliance issue. Um, some of the things that came out in the issue broadly, um, the issue of instrumentalization is critical. If we want to be led by values of solidarity, then engaging with spaces of broader civic action requires that we don't fixate on specific targets and goals that we set, but on how our resources can create space for agency and voice. And humility here emerged as key. Um, Trust-based engagement was flagged as critical. That means we're going to be need to be okay with being uncomfortable, with being challenged, with having our own views thrown out if that's what's required. Philanthropy, it was pointed out, needs to be enablers and amplifiers, not competitors for movements. Um, the third thing that came out of this issue for me strikingly was that, and we've been saying this for a long time, is we have to think beyond our silos to what intersectionality really does mean in a movement perspective. And what does solidarity in this context demand of us? Um, and the, the issue um, has several articles which talk to this. Lastly, we have to provide space and platforms for diverse and alternative views. Uh, what's emerging is that we are too comfortable funding those in our own mold and not comfortable enough with recognizing that there are other routes to a more just society. Our conversation is not the conversation and it's not the only conversation. And more, more importantly, it's not us it's not for us to determine what is appropriate activism, but to support activists in ways that they determine are appropriate. Um, I'm going to stop there now because I really think we want to be able to 
create space for much broader discussion. Um, so Charles, I'm going to hand over back to you for now. Thank you very much, Halima, for those opening comments and really setting out a reform agenda for the um, sector to consider um, going forward. Before we turn to um, Romy Kramer in um, Spain um, to talk a bit more about um, uh, social movements from the vantage point of her work, both as a guest editor and at the Gorilla Foundation, just want to run a quick poll question um, with you. Um, and you'll see in a moment a um, screen on the, uh, see on the right hand side, a screen asking this question. Do you think philanthropy does enough to engage with social movements? And you should be able to see answers, absolutely. It does its best, not nearly enough, and not at all. So please just type in your answers, all of you listening on the call, um, to get just a snap reaction to that question. Well, based on just um, some immediate comments, uh, immediate reaction coming in, over three quarters of you are so far saying that philanthropy is not doing nearly enough to engage movements and um, the rest is divided between feeling that not at all and well, it does its best. Um, so that agenda for change and reform that Halima mentions is clearly going to be relevant, at least to all of us here as we think about how it might might do more. And with that in mind, I'd now like to turn to Romy Kramer, who is the second of the co-guest editors of the issue. Um, welcome, Romy. Thank you, Charles. And uh, first of all, thanks to Halima also um, for initiating that special issue. Um, uh, very, very happy to have worked with both of you, Halima and Graciela, on that. Um, and thanks to the whole Alliance team for like pulling that off in the middle of a pandemic. Like All respect to you. Um, yeah, I think the poll actually uh, very much reflects what we were thinking about four years ago when um, the founder and I um, decided to set up the Gorilla Foundation that I'm running now. And we kind of really looked at where he could create the most impact in Europe with his money that he wanted to um, give into philanthropy. And it very quickly became clear from our research, but also like we were already interested in, in funding movements and activists, but also looked at social entrepreneurship funding, for example, and then very quickly realized that there's a lot of money, for example, going into social entrepreneurship, but like very, very little resources going to social movements. So very quickly made the decision that that is the field that we want to resource. and. Um, we stand in line with a couple of amazing funders um, and obviously I know mainly is seen in Europe but I just want to mention a couple of foundations that are also working in that space um, which is for example the Movement Foundation from Germany, Bewegungsstiftung that fund in the German speaking area, Patagonia Foundation, Stiftung Dun from the Netherlands, the X-Y Foundation but also amazing international funders like Mama Cash that works uh, with women, trans and intersex people, um, Grassroots International or the Global Green Grants Fund that funds the environmental movement and has an amazing participatory model of funding. Um, in that realm also there is um, Fund Action, a project that uh, we helped co-start, which is a participatory fund run by European activists that mainly funds, uh, that funds social movements and activism in, in Europe. Um, and also the Edge Fund in the UK, which is also another great participatory fund. And I'm sure I forgot loads and loads of amazing organizations. And it's great to see that there's so many individual organizations in that space, but all of them or the majority of movement funders are rather small. There's a couple of big foundations like Ford and Open Society and OSIFA that are funding movements as well. But like the majority of movement funders are comparatively small. And I think that is something that really needs to change in that space. Um, and there is a couple of bigger funders that are more and more getting interested in funding movements and engaging with movements. Um, in the UK, for example, the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust um, in the last, I think, year or two went through a process of engaging with movements, like a consultation to find out how they can support and resource that space. And I think that's really a way to go as a foundation if you want to engage with that space to kind of like first of all find out how you could really do that um which brings me to the second question that charles asked me to answer is like why is there such an uneasy relationship of, often between funders and social movements and i think it's all about kind of like the mindset and that traditional funders like they don't don't have that funding movements mindset like seeing movements funding movements as the strategy itself 
instead of kind of working towards specific outcomes you know like i really think that that mindset shift of being like resourcing grassroots movements and the forms of collective empowerment that come with that is already the strategy and then all goals all outcomes and impacts that are being produced come from the movements themselves and i think like if you if you manage to wrap your head around that within a foundation i think you're on a really good pathway um and then of course there's a lot of kind of like hurdles and, and halima referred to a couple already in terms of the organizational structure the expectation as to how professionalized and institutionalized an organization or collective has to be so that you can fund them with your organization and your demands that you have on reporting on engagement etc so i think there there's a lot to learn um and and we're in the middle of that process um continuously kind of like working and learning from our partners in that but you know, like, like, yeah, you're you. The worst mistake that you can make, I think, when you want to like work in that space, is like mistaking an NGO for a movement, and expecting that the style of working is the same as the one that you are running in your institution, where you have a paid job. Because a lot of the people, most of the people that are active in social movements and that are really driving change at a societal level, are unpaid volunteers. And um, if you realize that and you tell yourself that repeatedly, I think, um, again, like that is a very good first step to engaging uh, in, a, in a fruitful conversation. Um, and then like i want to talk a little bit of, about like also the time scale of the thinking because i think a lot of foundations think in like very linear theories of change they expect their organizations that they fund to have these and and also like they want to see outcomes that are produced you know by the projects that they're funding and i think if you start funding movements like you have to like um, like increase the, the the time scale in which you're thinking um, if you think about the women's movement you know like like how long did it take for women to gain the right to vote to not have to ask their husbands for getting unemployment etc so like that that scale and sometimes there's like periods of like increased activity like we now see with uh, uh the anti-racist movements and the movement of black lives but like like that is just a very punctual event in a much much larger history that these movements already have um, and i'm saying that because i think it's also important to know for funders interested in that space that they can engage with those spaces at different times and they can be more or less radical so to say more or less early stage you can you know like try like the Gorilla foundation to find and identify like young groups that are just emerging to support those and be really catalytic and send a signal to other foundations to get involved with those groups. But you could also just move in later and provide really the resources to grow and like build strategy, support cross-movement organization, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways how you can engage. And I think a lot of foundations are kind of afraid to getting into this because they think they have to support the super radical early stage activists you know and and i don't think that's that's the case necessarily it's more the way of thinking how change happens and on what time scale and then picking the movement you want to support and how you can get engaged with which part of that movement um finally i was asked to talk a little bit about how we determine who gets funding and i know it's like uh, uh, very quick but i think the, the main thing is that we're looking for as i said like very early stage grassroots groups that are really like affected by the issues they're talking about and we're trying to identify those that also have some sort of multiplication multiplier effect like some potential to do something in a more creative and more innovative more bold way than than maybe others and inspire beyond their immediate kind of area of activity so that's definitely one uh selection criterion that we have um, but we're also looking for groups and activists that are like willing and able to build these intersectional movements that also halima mentioned you know like to to really kind of not just focus on the issue and there we sometimes encounter groups that have been trained so to say by the funding sector to think in a specific issue to not be intersectional you know because this is where the funding goes it only goes to climate you know it doesn't go to working on lgbtqi or anti-racism anti-colonialism etc and i think that is what we have to change that we kind of push people movements into this mold just to be able to fund them i think we have to change and not the movements have to change um and i'm going to leave it at that i can say much more about this but i would love to take uh, a minute or two um, and, and hand over to caitlin who is one of our grantees and who should be on this call and i hope can click now the little hand button to be able to speak in a second she's from an anti-racist grassroots group uh, in the netherlands called kick out smart to pete and we literally just two weeks ago i think decided to to fund them 
Um, and I would just love to hear from you, Caitlin, like what your experience is so far with institutional funders and um, what you would advise institutional funders that want to get involved with you. Bear with us two moments. I'm just going to remove you, Romy, and Caitlin, you'll become a presenter. And while that is worked out, Caitlin, are you on? I don't think we can get Caitlin on. Sorry. Okay, but you kicked me out, so I'm just back. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can try again later. But like, I would just yeah. love to hear some like people, or maybe she can send something in the chat. That would be awesome because I think it's really important to like you know, not us to talk for people from movement, but like actually get them to say, hey, you know, that's what we would expect from funders. I think that would be amazing. Absolutely. Caitlin, please feel free to write into the chat and also other people about their experiences and expectations from funders themselves. And we are getting some great um, questions coming in, which we'll be going to in a moment once we've heard from um, Graciela Hopstein um, in Brazil, um, who will obviously be uh, talking about perspectives from Latin America, um, for example, how funders are engaging with the indigenous people's movements, which were discussed in the June issue, as well as the potential for racial justice um, um, in Brazil, um, given what's been happening um, there and around the world on that issue. So over to you, Graciela. Thanks, Charles, Alliance team, Romy and Halima for the opportunity to contribute with this amazing publication and for creating this space for discussion. Uh, thanks to everybody present in this room for participating in this webinar on a topic that is so relevant in the current political scenario and that I've been studying for years. Uh, to answer the question, it's important to highlight that we need to contextualize the analysis by talking about the pre-pandemic and pandemic scenarios. Uh, doing a quick analysis, it's, it's possible to observe that Latin America social movements that emerged and started to gain space in the political scene at the end of the 90s have installed new political agendas linked to diversity, inter intersectionality, access to rights and recognitions of identities. They also fight against conservative agenda like patriarchy, colonialism, racism, sexism, in opposition to neoliberalism politics and the conservative wave that has been impacting the region, the region basically in the last years. Social movements emerge in the current political context have also installed, installed new forms of collective organization, more horizontal and democratic, and new strategies of struggle, occupation of public spaces, spaces and communication platform, because in fact, communication is a key fighting strategy of these emerging movements. These dynamic, dynamics were present in the recent protests in Ecuador, Colombia and Chile that exploded in late 2019 and were marked by the presence of youth, women, indigenous people, residents of the peripheries of large cities. The struggles were focused on the demand of public agendas based on universal access to citizenship rights with the intention of building inclusive and democratic society, societies. International foundations like Ford, Oak, Inter-American Foundation, OSF and others have been important players in supporting social movements in Latin America. Many of them work in partnership with local funds like women funds, social justice funds, community funds, community foundation that have the capacity to reach out to the movements for doing grants because of their knowledge about their demands and network. Unfortunately, the Brazilian philanthropy that I know more profoundly and specifically foundation linked to corporate philanthropy that it's powerful in terms of financial resources, don't use to donate to civil society organization, much less to social movements or minorities. 
Certainly, uh, the context of the pandemic put a break on the Latin American movements and, pro and protests. In the context of social isolation, it was not possible to continue the protests on the streets. But in the peak of the pandemic in Brazil, which as everybody knows, is a country that is facing high levels of contamination and death, a consequence of the negativism and necropolitics promoted by Bolsonaro government, we observe the emergence of Black Lives Matters movement, Vidas Negras Importam, as a very relevant and significant demonstration of resistance, not only against Bolsonaro government, but against the police violence that systematically kills, even during the pandemic, young Black people <laughs> from the peripheries and communities. Sorry. The murder of Floyd and the American movement played a fundamental role in the disemergent waves in Brazil that implied the occupation of the street by black movements, even putting their body, bodies at risk and also in communication platforms. To talk more about this new wave of social movement and specifically about Black Lives Matters movement in Brazil, I would like to call or invite Selma Moreira, executive director of Baobá. Baobá is a, it's a local fund for social, um, for uh, racial justice, sorry. And Selma is also one of the authors of the June issue. So, uh, Amy, if you can open the mic to, to Selma, it will be great because she can contribute with the analysis even better than me. Thank you. Hi, Graciela. She's not online at the moment, so maybe if we move to questions and I'll let you know if, um, if we can get her on. She's not online. Well, well hopefully um, we can get her soon but um in her absence um just to say i'd encourage you to have a look at the article in the issue which is really about racial justice in brazil and a particular fund that she has helped to establish there um in the current context it's obviously even more relevant than now and it would be good um for anyone who's got questions around um racial justice in brazil or anywhere and the role that movements and philanthropy are playing um, i hope we can we can certainly discuss that. Before I come to some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat, I um, just wanted to put to everyone here a second poll question. Um, and that is, does your foundation or organization work with social movements? Uh, and the answer is, uh, it's your primary focus sometimes, but not as often as we'd like. No, but we're curious or, or not at all. And that's the second poll that should be coming up now and i should also add just while you're completing this that this um session is indeed being recorded and um will be shared and made available afterwards so that um you can reflect on some of the discussion today So judging by the initial reactions coming in from those of you um, listening, um, majority of people are saying sometimes, but not as often as they'd like. And only one in five on this call today um, have engagement with movements as a primary focus. So clearly it's an area with increasing and potential growing potential. Um, so given that we're about halfway through this Alliance webinar on social movements and philanthropy, I want to turn to some of the excellent questions that are coming in. Um, and I can also just say that there's been a lot of um, positive feedback for the comments from Halima and Romy and Graciela so far. So thanks to all of you for your introductions. Um, one question. Charles, sorry for interrupting, but Selma is in the platform. I don't know if Amy is it's, uh, it's, uh, looking at her, but she's really on the platform. So Okay, I will look to <laughs> We'll remove sorry. you from this, Graciela, and then I will put on Salma. Two moments. We'll look to get her in as soon as we can. 
while we're doing that, I posted a question in the in the chat in, in reply, so to say, to the poll. Like, I would love to see in the chat some replies from those who clicked sometimes, and and they would actually like to see more funding to social movements. Like, what would allow their organizations or them to do that? You know, like like what is the hindrances in the organizations that prevent this from happening? Because I'm assuming it's not that they just decide not to. And if you have answers to that. Ping, ping them in the chat. So also mm -hmm. a question from Anya Pino, um, uh, asking about power and unequal power relations and how they can be addressed. Um, um, and a question from Martin uh, Modlinger, um, who's raising question of whether there's something about larger foundations that makes them it harder for them to engage with movements. Some of the foundations you mentioned, um, Romy, not all of them by any means, but many of them are smaller and intermediary foundations that maybe would find it easier to work with um, foundation uh, with movements and, and some of the larger ones. And on a related point, um, Felicity Jones has raised the question about institutional constraints. Certain funders are um, only able to work within certain parameters and are constrained by charitable legislation about what they can fund, namely the very NGOs that Halima was warning us not to be, you know, uh, not to turn fat movements into. So how do you, how do you advise um, uh, getting around that that particular dilemma? So if any of you want to come back on that, um, then that would be that would be great. Um, equally, Selma, if you are um, available to speak, um, please do so now as well. Mm -hmm. I could say something about the institutional constraints and the charitable status. Um, Please go ahead, Rui. Because that, that is a very, very big issue, especially also in, in the German context right now about like certain civil society organizations also losing their charitable status and then the organizations that are funding them being afraid to, you know, um, have the same destiny basically um, by the tax authorities. Um, however, you know, in the end it is I think an easy answer to say we fund registered NGOs because they are recognized as charitable. Like I, I think that most charitable legislation always also has that clause that you as a charitable funder determine whether or not the activity you fund is charitable in your eyes, in your perception. Does it help you as a funder to fulfill your stated charitable goals? If yes, you can fund that. Even if the organization or not registered group of people carrying out the activity is not necessarily registered as charitable. So that is basically what we are running on with the Gorilla Foundation. And it's 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 like I think it's about us in the sector trying to change that legislation, which is like there's efforts on the way in Germany to really change the charitable legislation because it is actually hampering the activity of a lot of people. But within that existing legislation, we can work. And I think Germany is a very restrictive environment in that sense. Um, so so that is it's possible. It's just not easy. And it's maybe un uncomfortable sometimes because you're kind of like, it's a balancing act. Um, and the same counts for like political activity. You know, what is the definition of political activity? Of course, you can't fund a political party. I think that is not in, in no country you can, as a charitable foundation, support a political party. But what you can, for example, support, and we have done that with this Fearless City Summit in Barcelona, organized or close to Barcelona and Comú, which is the party running uh, the city, but not by Barcelona and Comú. So there was a group of activists that organized that summit which brought together municipalists from around the world to exchange knowledge as a platform to plan actions together etc and that could be funded so we could fund people to attend that summit we couldn't have funded barcelona and Comú as a party but it's about like finding clever workarounds in a way and, and then being a bit creative if you really want to support that space thank you H halima would you like to comment on that as well Sure, Charles. Um, uh, just before I do, though, I've seen another um, chat by Salma saying she's here and ready to present. So um, I just want to okay, well, give a second. OK, um, if we can give the floor Thank to you. Salma, um, and then you can come in after that, Halima. I think we're having difficulties adding presenters and we've lost Graciela. So if you could carry on, Halima, okay. that would be great. All right, um, so um, there's, uh, there's an interesting conversation going on in the chat around um, legislation and what as a charity you're allowed to fund but also if you're an intermediary um, and you have to account to your donors what then you're also allowed to fund and i think there's um there's the 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 legal framework that that shapes what you can and can't do but there are also many things 
that we can do within that legal framework that we sometimes are not bold enough in exploring. And um, uh, somebody asked, you know, what are some of the ways? And recently we're seeing um, collaborative funds uh, having a little bit more wiggle room to fund things that you as maybe a large funder uh, cannot do for all different sorts of reasons, be it process or you know institutional systems or just the fact that you're not anywhere near the ground. We're also seeing, um, for example, um, uh, movement-led funds. Um, uh, Kislein and Ebrima are both involved in an African um, movement fund here and they both can probably talk much better to it. But I think the biggest thing to ask is where are the legal limitations and where are our own institutional limitations that are set by our mind frames around what we think our role in philanthropy is uh, or what we think our role as philanthropy is. And when we start to shift what we think that role is, it opens up space for a different kind of discussion and it opens up avenues for different forms of support to go to movements. As I said earlier, it's not always necessarily cash. There are different ways of engaging. These have to be um, determined by movements, not necessarily by us. Um, but I think that we have been very used to thinking about institutional form and registered NGOs um, uh, as the primary means of support. Um, and we have to start thinking differently. And that's, that's um, it's, Romy mentioned several organizations who are doing that. So it's not impossible to do, uh, but we have to figure out the how. And I think that requires much more considered attention. Um, I think Anna was asking about unequal power relations and really um, it's about humility. It's about understanding that solidarity means starting by listening and not assuming that we know. And it's about engaging on substantive levels and taking direction from those that we want to support. Um, all of those things start to shift uh, power and it's about recognizing that it's not our voices that count. Um, you know, it's not our perspective, but it is those who are actually bearing the brunt of the injustice and doing the work whose voices needed to be given space. Thank you very much for those comments, um, Halima. Um, Tatiana Cordero um, from Power, um, no pun intended, um, references <laughs> the role of um, women's funds as funders of women's rights and social movements. And um, it'd be useful if um, perhaps in a moment Graciana could comment on, is there anything about women's funds and maybe being more horizontal in nature and more democratic that presents a good model? Um, also, um, uh, Emmanuel Otu at the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, which is a uh, significant funder of human rights um, uh, causes, um, talks about gaps in capacity. Um, which seems to relate to your point, Halima, about um, the how. How can um, funders help build capacity and fill um, gaps, uh, particularly for community-based uh, movements? So maybe we'll start with Graciela, if I may, on women's funds, which are obviously a notable feature of the Latin American landscape. Sorry, Charles, I, I had technical problems. I missed the, the first part of the question. Can you repeat sure, it, please? Course. Yeah, um, we have a question from Tatiana about the role of women's funds and whether they might be an example of how to work effectively with movements because of perhaps there's certain characteristics that they have that can maybe point the way. Um, could, could you maybe just comment on that, please? Yes, sure. Uh, hi, Tatiana, great question. Um, well, I, I, as I've told uh, to you in my, 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 in my presentation, uh, this is one of the most important ideas, the idea of uh, having partnerships with local funds. I think that international philanthropy or the big foundations in general, uh, it's important to, to have the, the local funds, women funds, social justice funds as, as partners to funding exactly a social movements because local funds are really very connected to so social movements. They know exactly their reality, where they are, what they are, they are doing. So uh, I, I don't like to 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 to, to understand them as as regranters or intermediary funds because they are much more than that. But I think this partnership, uh, specifically with women funds, that they are really very active in the region in the region 
it's really very uh, effective in terms of doing grants and supporting social movements because of the knowledge of local uh, funds about them. For example, I know that uh, action, uh, action uh, urgent action fund, for example, know exactly where are the defenders, what they need. So I think that the partnership between the big foundations and, and local funds, it's really very, very important and effective in funding social movements. Thank you. Graciela, and I should just clarify that Tatiana is in fact from the Urgent Action Fund in mm -hmm. Latin America rather than a power, um, but she was referencing them. Um, I could speak to the issue of capacity very you, briefly. You um, I think it's, it's again kind of a bit of a, coming from this mindset of like, we set the expectations in the foundation and then we kind of make the judgment of like the, the group does not have the capacity to fulfill them in a way so you know i think they very if you identified them as a relevant group let's say um but they have the capacity to create change that's what they want to do they want to create an impact and they need resources for that and i think it's also about us looking at our expectations as to you know reporting how professional your email has to be that you write to me etc so I'm not saying that you can't work on this together but excluding a group because you think they don't have the capacity, you should ask yourself twice, like what capacity you actually mean. If it's the capacity to create impact, okay. But if it's the capacity for, to fulfill your requirements, maybe you want to rethink that and kind of like work with them and ask them how they could do what they could do, you know, what impact means for them, how they would like to report on this, you know? So kind of being a bit more liberal there in that sense and, 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 and empowering also people in your organization maybe to uh, have personal trusted relationships like the program managers or whatever they're called with the people they fund, you know, and, and then making them accountable to report back whatever is important within your organization but not putting that burden on the people in in the grassroots group thank you very much Romy um, I want to just bring in a question from David Bombright here who's a who's a veteran of um the social change field but also um was involved in some of the early anti-apartheid struggles and he mentions in the chats about um the need for trust and flexibility and how that is harder when you're not personally connected or invested with the people in the movement. So he's asking whether the idea of effective philanthropic support needing to be based on and cultivated by personal connections and shared values um, as an important enabler, which maybe cuts a cap across a more bureaucratic approach. Um, I wonder whether that resonates um, with um, any of you in, in your own experiences. And feel free, um, any of you who are able to speak um, uh, at this moment, I'm sorry that we aren't able to bring in others, but do speak with your words in the chat bar as well. And we'll try, I'll try to um, bring as many of those comments in, but um, back to either Romy, Halima or Graciela to just comment on that personal element. Uh, the I totally, element like. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, and that's why I think participatory funders are so important, like projects like, you know, the Edge Fund in the UK or Fund Action, where, it's activists deciding about money going to other activists, you know, because they can relate much better. They, they find ways to, you know, distribute resources in a way that like people, everybody's happy in the, in the end, because even if you didn't receive any funding, you might receive like a network and learning and exchange and mutual support and solidarity. So kind of making it about so much more than just uh, funding, but also about community. And, and building these shared values also in the process as you go along. So I think it's it's super important. And, and of course, that also speaks to this issue of like the size of the organization that I think Martin uh, raised earlier. Um, you know, like if you are a massive, let's say Ford Foundation or whatever, and you have a very centralized uh, model of operating and, and, and like a centralization of power, then you might have a very hard time, you know, engaging with movements. But if you'd like delegate that power to your program managers, like a lot of the big foundations do, you know, like program managers can, decide about rather large amounts of funding by themselves you kind of you know create this slight decentralization already and then that program manager working only with let's say women's movements or, or you know like lgbtqi or anti-racism etc knows the people is aligned you know and it, it also comes back to your hiring policies as a foundation of course like like who do you bring into your your organization and or that like 
you know, all white people uh, running the anti-racism program, that might be a problem. So, yeah. Halima, can you comment on that from your vantage point? Perhaps um, agreements, um, Saul and um, Gislaine, who've both contributed to the issue about their work with movements in the DRC and in, um, I think, uh, uh, Gambia. Um, I'd be interested to hear whether, whether that has been a feature, that personal contact has been a feature of the social movement fund that was established by them. Yeah, and I'm, I'd love to hear from either Huslain or Abrima, who both I think have been involved in, in that fund. So if they're around, please just um, type in the chat or raise your hand to speak if you can. I'm, I'm not sure if we can bring them in to talk. But, uh, you know, so there's distance, um, but there are ways of getting around distance. And it's about how committed you are to working in, in a different kind of mode. And it's about your your framing of what you see as your role with social movements. So uh, you have to, I, I think the onus has to be on funders to find ways to mitigate the distance. The onus shouldn't be on movements to find ways to reach us in ways that we can understand. We need to engage and, and engage substantively. You can't do movement funding from afar. Um, it's not possible. If you want to engage, you have to either engage directly or find mechanisms that do engage directly. Because only then with you, will your funding be led by those who you're trying to support. Um, otherwise, you're constantly making assumptions. Um, and I think that's going to be, that's part of the biggest challenge. Um, the other is that, you know, we're holding ourselves as philanthropy organizations to specific kinds of outcomes and indicators. Um, and we have to ask ourselves what role that plays in the extent to which we engage um, with multiple diverse and alternative voices that are not normally heard and that don't have influence. Um, so I want to put those two things out there. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Helen um, Veach. Apologies for the pronunciation if it's wrong. Um, can any of you um, talk about funding for child-led or youth-led groups of activists, uh, which tend otherwise to be facilitated by adult-led umbrella organisations? And before you answer that, a direct question for Graciela from Gabriela Boyer, um, who asks whether ultimately it is the responsibility of national and local funders to support their own countries social movements rather than say overseas or international funding. Um, do you have any advice about um, how that base of local funding can be built up and how international funders can support that effort? Um, so first to you, Graciela, please. Well, I will answer to Gabby first. I think it's a great question. Um, and as I've, as I've, I've mentioned in my presentation, I think that uh, local philanthropy in general, uh, they are not doing grants for civil society organizations. So we have a very big problem. But on the other hand, uh, we are looking at a movement uh, uh, managed by, by GIFI, that is the, the association of corporate uh, foundation in Brazil that they are influencing all the time for that you know for for uh, for doing for philanthropy for corporate philanthropy to do more grants to civil society organization and to broader agendas not only to education childhood youth you know the 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 the, the, the traditional philanthropy so I, I think it's important and, and there are a lot of initiatives for example for foundation support years ago uh, an initiative exactly for that for connecting um, um, corporate philanthropy to local funds exactly to promote uh, a change for their action so i think that we are in a very uh, good uh, scenario for that and in fact chifi for example it's an important partner uh, uh for the network with it in that front so i think uh we need to it's, it's a long way we need to put a lot of energies but i think that we are in the in the correct way and we are working for that but for seeing results we need to wait maybe for a couple of years uh, but in fact we are looking for uh, in interesting movements uh, regarding this connection between 
local funds and local philanthropy or big philanthropy uh, in Brazil. Thank you, um, Graciela. And would um, either Romy or Halima want to respond to the comment about um, youth-led funds? Or rather youth-led movements and what funds can do to support them? We, I mean, I can briefly say we have looked at Fridays for Future. Um, we have funded like a small group, um, like one local group in, in, in Greece. Um, but yes, they're, they're very quickly, um, especially in the German context, we're like parents, you know, like a pair, a group of parents that are kind of like setting up an umbrella organization um, for their kids in a way. Um, that approached us for funding then later, you know? So I think it's very hard to directly fund um, uh, youth-led groups, um, but maybe that's also not necessary in certain contexts, like, because that particular parent group was like in Germany and I'm like, youth in Germany that that, that want to get organized, I think have, have a lot of like opportunity with crowdfunding, for example, et cetera, they can go to their parents. They maybe don't need that many resources because they live at home, you know, they, they they are resourced in a certain way, you know, of course, if you look at other countries, there might be a totally different picture, you know, and, um, and that's why I'm just like saying, I pointing that out very specifically, but it's also very hard because like in, in other countries where the context isn't that great for general social movements and activist funding, you know, like finding a youth led movement that is there already that you're not artificially creating with your money, I think is very hard because like of the lack of infrastructure in general for movement funding, you know, so, yeah, I don't know, maybe Halima can speak to that, like youth movements in Africa, you know, um, I think that would be super interesting. Um, but before you do, Halima, if I may, I also want to shift the lens onto the anti-racism movement and specifically the Black Lives Matters protest. Um, Caitlin um, Schapp, who was mentioned earlier, um, who's been involved in these protests in the Netherlands, has written that she's a, um, from um, the Amazon, has been fighting um, uh, for the rights of indigenous people and organizations, but feels that sometimes there's an expectation to meet and jump into kind of Western funding hoops in order to get funding, to meet, to, to as, as she puts it, traditional structures of leadership, which are against the uh, spirit of the very communities they're trying to protect. Um, so I just wonder whether um, any of you would like to just comment both on that point specifically, but more, but also in addition, the wider context of the anti-racism movement. Um, it would be remiss not to have some specific discussion about that, given what's going on around the world today. And these will have to be um, closing comments, I'm afraid, from from all of you. Thanks, Charles. So um, uh, I'll try and combine some of um, uh, the questions that you've put forward uh, together with um, it's Sheila's statement around movements represent those issues that state and global frameworks don't recognize. And I think it's really important to think about movements as bringing in alternative voices and alternative narratives around what's important and what's our role in helping to create the space for that, um, which then means that you know, if you're looking at whether it's youth led movements or other constituency led movements, what are you doing specifically to enable that space? It's hard. It's extremely hard. Funding movements is not easy work, but we're not in this to be doing easy work. Uh, we're in this for something else. So how do we start to f make the space for those voices to really set a new table? Um, it isn't just about making, you know, a seat at an, at an existing table that's within a particular kind of framework, but what does this new table look like? And who are the, the voices that are influencing what the discussions at those tables are, I think is really, really important. Um, the, the current protest that we're seeing around Black Lives Matter, I think has, for me, I've seen the kinds of critique around philanthropy in this last, um, month that I haven't seen in years. Um, and I think so it's really opened up. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really opened up the conversation around voice and perspective around not speaking on behalf of. But I think it's also really opened up some very, very hard questions for philanthropy to engage on around their practice and around um, some, um, their history and what they're doing around um, what the movement for Black Lives Matter is raising, or the issues of the movement for Black Lives Matter is raising, um, and it and it demands that we ask ourselves these hard questions around um, intersectionality, around voice, around thinking that we know um, what it is that needs to be done. Um, so I'm I'm, I'm going to stop there because I think um, this I want to leave some space for others to to respond to this as well. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, 
Thank you. Um, Romy, or indeed Graciela, maybe Romy first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, also very briefly, I mean, I think um, obviously with like this this high point in the movement right now, there will a lot, a lot, there will be a lot of resources going into anti-racial uh, uh, activism and uh, anti-racist activism, and I think that is that is just amazing um, because you know it is a very important issue. I just want to point out though that like, yeah, the the idea of like supporting the emergence of intersectional movements or supporting movements that are intersectional is like super important as well and and you know so like when you're a climate funder it doesn't mean that you can look at anti-racism you know you have to and what does that mean you have to look at climate justice you know you fund groups that like work on climate justice and not just like the white upper middle class climate group that you maybe conveniently fund because you can better relate to them and that relatability i think goes back to like who works in your foundation the issues of power that that Halima referred to you know like who are you and and what kind of a problem do we have in philanthropy you know with where our money comes from but also how we're set up and I can again speak to mainly to the European philanthropic scene it is predominantly white you know and, um, and that is that is an issue um, and it's very undiverse in general also with, with respect to gender and gender identities etc thank you and Graciela uh, well, what I wanted to add to the reflection is about uh, to think about the individual giving also in the context of philanthropy, uh, because when we're talking about philanthropy now in this discussion, we are talking mainly about a uh, big foundation. And it's important to look at individual giving because, in fact, movements and militants and activists are all the time working in, mobilize, in, mob, in mobilizing resources uh, with individual giving. Uh, and I think it's important also to look at that, uh, to look at uh, self-organizations of uh, fundraising, uh, because they put money from their own pockets to the movements. And I think it's important to do that. And, and it's important for philanthropy to look at that because self-organization is really very important for the movements because they are funding them themselves. And I think uh, uh, that philanthropy and, and we as philanthropists in general, we need to look at this phenomenon uh, and, and to connect this uh, fundraising or this mobilization of resources based on individual giving to foundations because maybe it's another line that we need to, to look and to strengthen in general. Thank you, uh, Graciela, for that. I'm going to be wrapping up in a moment, but I do just want to just um, highlight a couple of other questions and comments that have come in. Um, uh, Laurie Villarosa asks a, very, asks a very interesting question and observes that how many funders are actually really legally constrained? Uh, to, in, in their reticence in some cases to fund movements or is there an excess of caution about what can be funded? Um, and she asks whether there are entities like the US-based Alliance for Justice that can support and provide training to funders to maybe broaden the scope of what's allowable and while we might not have time to discuss that particular question today it is worth reflecting on about ultimately is, is, is the courage there and what does risk in philanthropy mean? Um, but I'd want to just give the um, Final um, words to Selma Marrera, who unfortunately we weren't able to bring in today, but has um, uh, been involved in the racial justice effort and funding for it um, in Brazil. And she says that Black Lives Matter is for everybody. And if social justice and equity are in the heart of the philanthropic world, we need more allies working with funders and social movements to build another world, to build justice in societies, to preserve lives, dignity and voice. Um, and it seems to bring us back to some of the very core values that are at the heart of many of the progressive social movements and certainly those reflected in the latest issue of, of Alliance. Um, so I want to just wrap up by saying thank you to um, Halima, Mohammed, um, Graciela Hopstein and Rami Kramer, our superb and expert guest editors for really making this issue of Alliance as, as truly global as we try to be. And making sure that a diversity of voices um, and countries were represented. Um, thanks to our team at Alliance behind the scenes, in particular Amy um, McGoldrick for for um, delivering today's event. And thanks to all of you here for being part of the Alliance community, our own social movement within philanthropy, um, holding up a mirror to the field and uh, trying to be a reforming and modernising voice 
but we're from within the sector. Um, as I said earlier, we invite you to submit letters um, and comments of 150 words. Um, you can email them to us um, for publication in the next issue. Um, also, everyone who's registered today will receive a video recording of this discussion in the next uh, few days. And on Tuesday, there'll be a full and detailed write-up of this discussion, drawing on some of the co comments and some of the things that you've been um, describing um, today. So look out for that. And all that's left is really for me to say um, thank you and look out for our September issue, which will be um, exploring the topical issue as well of foundation investments, um, how investments are made and how they relate to grant making. Um, the September issue will also see the launch of our Philanthropy Confidential column, which is a, an opportunity to receive um, feedback about some of the challenges and ethical dilemmas that um, we all face in the sector. Um, there'll be more about that in, in September. So please do um, go to alliancemagazine.org. You can subscribe if you're not already um, with the discount code um, movements20. And I um, just want to thank you all for your participation today. And we, we look forward to you joining us for further discussions on this and, and other topics. Thank you and um, solidarity to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.